and those who are trying to be with us. Uh, hopefully, uh, they'll get on in a few minutes. Um, good to see everyone today. And uh, as we continue with uh, our Bible study on the post-resurrection saying of Jesus, uh, let us begin with prayer. Gracious God, as we gather together on this day, we come looking to each other's needs and looking also into our hearts as we cast our minds and our thoughts and our hearts back many thousands of years to the, year, the years following Jesus' death and resurrection. Inspire us and show us how your spirit speaks to us in these times. Amen. Amen. So today we have uh, two passages, very short ones, one from the end of Matthew's gospel and one from the end of Mark's gospel. Uh, the uh, Matthew one uh, begins just after he tells us that the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. And they saw him there and worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember... I am with you always to the end of the age. And then uh, from Mark's gospel, and this is the, uh, uh, as, as, as we know, Mark, uh, has, there's a sort of second ending to Mark's gospel, and this is part of that second ending. Uh, and it's uh, very similar to the one from Matthew. Um, it, it says he appeared to the 11 disciples as they were sitting at the table uh, and upbraided them because of their lack of faith and stubbornness. Uh, then he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the good news to the whole creation. The one who believes and is baptized will be saved, but the one who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. By using my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes in their hands. And if they drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. So those are the two passages that we have to look at today. And uh, so um, perhaps we could begin by asking people what struck them in what strikes you in these passages that seem to maybe not have struck you before? Is there something that you heard or read in these passages that seemed uh, to make you think or to something surprising or whatever? Uh, Ellen, as I'm getting um, older and doing more studying and so on. I really have to question Mark's gospel about the only way to the Lord is through Jesus because it becomes an exclusion, um, exclusion kind of um, proposition. And even though we can be disciples and we can spread the news we can't expect that everybody has to have our same belief that that is the only way. Are we saying that people who are good people, who are um, like Buddhists or Muslims or whatever, are we saying that they're not going to get into heaven? Is that what we're saying? Or is that what Mark's saying is what I'm saying? Mm, good question. Any other thoughts on that topic? Well, I hope that's not what Mark is saying. I share that concern, Linda, is my point. Mm 
Yeah, yeah. I'm wondering, um, I guess as we try to be more inclusive with our faith and spread the word and so on, um, we have to be careful that we're not like, this is, we're holier than thou, this is the only way. We have to um, spread the word in a, um, in a non-biased way, I guess, is what I'm saying. Or I, I don't know, I struggle with this. I, I was not even going to join today because I struggle with this whole um this whole writing of Mark. I, I wrote to Karen and said that, and I just, um, I don't know, I guess I just have to do more reading, I suppose. Well, I'm glad you came anyway. Paul, <laughs> oh, I, I would just I would just add, I've, I've been um, wrestling with that question my entire lifetime and have moved from a place of what I would say Jesus as exclusive to the Jesus Christ that I understand who is the universal Christ of not only the first creation, which is uh, the creation of the world and all of the inhabitants of it, but the second creation, uh, to a much more inclusive understanding of what I would call the universal Christ. I don't, I don't think that um, Jesus' last name is Christ. You know, I mean, I think it's, it's bigger than that. And I think that we get in trouble when we start trying to truncate and limit the capacity of God's outreach uh, into the world. So I, I hear where you're coming from, and um, I also hear that in what Jim is saying too. So that we hope that, um, not sure where where Mark is coming from. Um, I've always noticed those kind of differences uh, in in his in his viewpoint. So just add my opinion. One of the ways I sort of came to terms with this myself was from, I think it was Ken Bailey who said that for those of us that have heard the message, it is the only way for us. That Christ has essentially extended his hand and we either accept or reject it. So those of us that have heard Christ's message, that is our choice. And there may be consequences if we reject the Christ message, but it wasn't saying that that's everybody's way. That it was just those of us that have heard this story, we have the choice to accept or reject. But those people that have not heard this story, it's not necessarily condemning them. But for those of us that have heard, this is our option. So that was how I kind of reconciled it a little bit. It's that I don't think they're condemning people who haven't heard this story. And, and really what they're, what Jesus is doing is telling people to go and make disciples of all nations. Go out and tell the story. Uh, people then have the freedom to respond to the story. Um, but one of the things that struck me was this early baptismal formula here. Uh, I, I was kind of amazed that, uh, that this was, this was in, in Mark's gospel, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Seems to me that the whole development of thinking of God in these different ways the Trinity was a much later thing, but here it is right in uh, in Mark's gospel, or is that in the Matthew part? Um, so it was a very early formula for baptism, it seems, that Trinitarian formula going way back to the first century. That, that kind of surprised me. Um, This is about making disciples, about uh, going out into the world and, uh, and preaching the gospel. Um, the other thing that I thought was kind of interesting was the business about healing the sick. Thinking of our situation in the world today, um, uh, that, that was something that struck me. I don't know about the snakes business, but the... Uh, certainly about laying on of hands and, and healing the sick. And uh, uh, as we are in the midst of this pandemic, I actually went back to a book I have by Rodney Stark, who's a sociologist about the rise of Christianity. And he talks a lot about the plagues that were around in the second century and how Christianity grew because of the attitude of Christians to looking after the sick 
it's a very interesting uh, story, especially in the times in which we live, where we see so many uh, of our healthcare workers who are practicing their faith, their their profession in healing the sick, and often dying as as a result of it. So that was the second thing that leaped out from these passages for me. But isn't it amazing that that one little phrase uh, about, you know, handling the snakes, which, you know, is just a teeny bit led to this group of, you know, Christians uh, in the mountains of wherever in the United States formed a church at that, you, you know, you see that occasionally where, you know, they're handling snakes and it's, you know, it's crazy that you would form a church out of just that one little phrase. Nowhere else is it, well, at least I don't know if it's mentioned anywhere else, but that you could have a, a church cult, whatever, based on just that little phrase. Yeah, and I think it's the last three or four months, somebody recently died doing that. Was it, did you remember that? Mm, no, yeah, I, I've it was, seen it on it, TV uh, on some of the shows. Or, yeah. So I, yeah. here's, here's kind of my thought with Linda and is and I have not followed up. I am not a Mark person. So when I go to the Gospels, Mark is not the gospel I usually go to. But we know that this was later written. Why why was this added in? What was the context? So I I, I mean I think we have to go back and say, okay, so who wrote it? Was it the same I, I don't remember. I'm sorry guys, but some of you scholars out there might know. So who wrote this part or who did they attribute it to? Why was it written? What was going on then? Because, I mean, it's very different from everything else. And I think in the other Gospels. So, um, I think it is like a, a narrow way of thinking. It's like almost mm -hmm. tunnel vision. Whereas Paul's explanation like is so inclusive. And that's, that to me yeah. is how we it, are disciples. To me, Linda, it seems responsive to something. I mean, it seems yeah. like. I'm responding to some situation that's happening now or what the climate is or what, you know, but, you know. We have to kiss in on one thing or something, yes. Yeah, well, who on this call here is a Mark scholar? No. No. <laughs> I'm just saying, but somebody might know a little, I don't know if Jim or Paul or someone knows a little bit more. About I went Mark. to John. I never was a, much of a Mark fan. I, either, so. look at Mark. I mean, no, how many I, times, I guess, you know? I guess for me, uh, you know, what I just what I noticed in, in light of the little email thing that you sent us with the attachment to be thinking about this was just the difference between Matthew, who comes out with his proclamation, if you will, about what it means to go and be disciples, based on people who were struggling and, in one sense, and doubting. And if this is a later edition with Mark, and it opens, you know, in that verse uh, leading into that. This is a bunch of people who lack faith and stubbornness. Is there some kind of result that this writer, whoever is adding this addendum to it, was looking for about the delivery of the message of this go out and make disciples? He didn't feel like there was enough results coming. I mean, you know, it, I almost get the feeling, why is Mark so hung up about uh you know, about being much more specific about this is what you're going to go and do. Matthew just says, go and make disciples. He doesn't really write a script and say, and these are all the 19 or 20 things that you're supposed to do. But this one goes on and, and adds, well, you know, go handle snakes. Uh, make sure you do this other thing. It just... Yeah, drink that poison. Yeah, but yeah, we, yeah. We also have to remember, I think it's in behooves us to remember, Mark was written first. Yeah, right. So Luke and Matthew and John are later. So, you know, once again, what's the context of Mark? What's their context? And have they, you know, why did they not include that in theirs? Which is very interesting. Of all the things they included, they didn't include any of that in theirs. Yep. One of the like commentaries. <laughs> yeah, one of the he commentaries. He didn't like it either. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, one of the commentaries I've read it. Uh, which it's not a, a a book that I go to Bible that I go to often, but it says it's possible that the original ending of Mark was lost, and um, 
It's also possible that Mark ended his story with verse 8, showing that the disciples were still afraid and confused, unable to grasp the truth of the resurrection, and no one liked that. So it was added later. They didn't Maybe. want to leave it hanging. Maybe the... Uh... Maybe the people who had followed this advice of handling snakes and drinking poison hadn't had good results, and so the other, the later writers didn't include that at all as a <laughs> way to spread the word. But to get back to the uh, to the business of the healing, um, th this was really uh, one of the ways that Christianity grew uh, during these times was that um, Christian, Christians uh, believed differently from the society in which they lived, that, um, that Jesus came for everyone, uh, not, uh, and, and it didn't matter if you were sick or not either, and, uh, or if you were contagious, Jesus came for all, and uh, you know, the parable of the last judgment tells us if you looked after these, one of the least of these, you looked at, you looked after me, or you cared for me. So, the, the part of the message that they were taking out was about healing, um, and uh, I think that's a kind of a remarkable thing, right here at the beginning, that they even the, you know, apart from the snake business. <laughs> Um, but laying hands on the sick, and often that was simply, as as this writer was telling the sociologist, simply a matter of nursing, kind of basic nursing care, taking people food and water during these times of plague, and uh, and not worrying about. Well, the other thing is uh, th that they believed that they, you know, uh, death was something that Jesus had experienced. He had conquered death they were not afraid of death and so they were not afraid to uh go and heal the sick and nurse the people who were who were dying and so on and that resulted in, in some of the remarkable early growth this guy says of the christian movement could that be part of the early growth uh being discernment now, I'm not a Mark person either. I just, I, I don't generally go to Mark, but I was just thinking about what avenues of discernment do we have between the true gospel and the this other types of uh, beliefs? How do we discern the true gospel? Is that yeah. Gospel? yeah. That's a good question. <laughs> don't don't all of us sort of have our own individual what we believe about Jesus and so on, and we kind of things that don't kind of fit into our picture, we we tend to maybe ignore them or say, well, that you know, I, uh, you know what I'm trying to say here? Yeah. Yeah. I totally I totally get it because I like Paul. I'm a John fan. And uh, I would have followed John, John if I had lived in that time off to the off to the Celts, <laughs> and uh, some of us would have followed Peter into Rome. So um, I think it's it is a personal thing, and I think your spiritual growth and religious growth is a, a, a personal thing. Yet you want to ask these questions to get a better understanding of how were these people thinking? Why did they think this way? But we can expand our thinking now that we know we can see the bigger picture. They they only had a very small window to look at. We have the bigger picture. We are fortunate that way. So, um, so how can you um, come? How can we get to some consensus about Mark's exclusiveness? And then what's John and for John 14 says that nobody comes to the father except through me. And, and, it, and I'm not, I mean, I, I'm, I don't have any issues with picking the Bible scriptures that fit my belief system. So I don't really have, but we can't, but how do we, 
how, how, how do we pick one over the other? Say, well, I'm a John person, but John's writing says basically, you know, no one comes to the father except through me. And then we say that, but the Mark thing we don't like. So I want to try to get to the point where what's the criteria for the scriptures that we, we affirm and we uphold versus the scriptures that we don't like. So for me, I, I just expand my definition of Christ and, and my Christ becomes uh, more inclusive of, from the beginning of creation all the way up until today in the middle of a pandemic. Um, that's, that's the way that I deal with the contradictions. I don't see them necessarily as contradictions. I see them as statements and maybe in moments of time based yeah. on people's maybe their own reflections and their own needs. Their own needs at the time. I think another way of uh, uh, looking at what I hear Paul saying is that my perception is that Jesus Christ is considerably bigger than all the centuries of Christian thought have perceived him to be. And that uh, it may just be that when some of the gospels speak of what we consider to be exclusion, imply exclusion, that they may be referring to a much more profound event. That it is that what God did in Christ was absolutely decisive for all of creation. And that in itself is to me an inclusive concept that indicates that God has embraced all of God's creation and drawn drawn it. And that that if it is that we're saved only through Christ, for me it has to be at that level of profundity. That Christ is uh, that what Christ did has universal implications, and I think we've tended, on the other hand, with when we think exclusively to put the action on human beings, that 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 uh, when we perceive uh, Mark, for example, to be saying that or John, that uh, the only way to God is through accepting Jesus Christ as Savior, being baptized being a part of the uh, institutional church, et cetera. Yeah, does anybody resonate with what, what I'm trying to get at here? I'm not being very clear. But, uh, well, but, but God has acted in Christ and has embraced me and has embraced uh, my Muslim brother and has embraced my Hindu brother. And uh, they come at that. They've appropriated that differently and may not even use Christian terms and names. But... Their experience of faith, their experience of salvation is made possible through the gift of Christ that was more impactful than just on a religion. It was had universal implications. Yeah, now, if, in that, that sense, if, in that sense, I can I can kind of feel at home with the uh, with the uh, Jesus says, no one comes to the Father except through me. That is through the provision God has made through me. And yet there's kind of a patronizing implication in that thought itself. Hmm. So, Linda, maybe we can't get off the horns of this. <laughs> maybe we're well, stuck with uh, that. But, uh, but I, I feel much more comfortable saying, God, what God has done, Jesus Christ, has, has embraced all of creation and impacted all of creation feel much more comfortable with that than saying that uh, what he's done in Christ has to be appropriated in a specific religious way. I guess I'm saying the universality like you are of the father encompassing like the universe. It's, it's way bigger than us. And we know the story of Jesus and that brings us to the bigger picture that everybody has included. So we think about people who are very, very, very good people who do good acts 
they haven't yet found Jesus or God or whatever, but they are go definitely going to be there. Oh, my phone fell. They're going to definitely be with the Father uh, because that is God of the universe. I, I see the uni universality. It's way bigger than Jesus. Like it's Jesus, but it's the Holy Spirit, God, all in one. And we have to, I think if we're going to be good disciples, we have to, in, um, not, I'm, and this isn't preachy, it's just to see the universality of it, whereas Mark is, it seems more exclusive, and John, I think more inclusive. I see that anyway. That's how I read it. But Bruce might differ. I'd like to hear what Bruce says. Well, I don't, I don't differ. My question was to push you on how you read the Bible and what yeah. criteria you use to interpret or um, affirm one, you know, like uh, uh, one text over another text. So that was all. I don't have any disagreement whatsoever um, with the interpretation. It was more like, okay, so how do you, how, what's the criteria for reading the Bible and why do we lift up certain verses and we, we don't, we don't read other verses or if we read them, we read them quietly. So no one can hear it kind of, it's, that, it's that was more of my question. Yeah. Not the uh, interpretation. It was more of a, how do you yeah. read the Bible and what criteria do you use uh, exactly. when we read the Bible? I think as uh, Jerry uh, said, um, it's discernment. We all discern in different ways and um, our understanding as um, leads us to where we are. Um, so for me, I'm seeing the bigger picture, not, a like, not an exclusivity, but an inclusivity. And I think that we can all have our own beliefs and we shouldn't push them on anyone else. We just have to feel good in what is in us. That's all I am saying. Bruce, in response, in response to your question, I, I think, um, for me, the, the Bible as I've looked at it from the time that I was a youngster raised in a very conservative environment um, to where I am today, I sort of sometimes go along with the image that I'm, I'm taking, I take a balcony view of scripture. You know, when I look down at it now, I, I look at it more holistically, more inclusively than I did when I was down off the balcony, down in the middle of it, just trying to meander around between the books trying to make sense out of it either chronologically or any other way um, and part of what's helped with that is scholarship commentary reflection being open to other people's thinking that's bigger than my own um, so that's all been a part of the journey for me of how i now look at the bible um, with much broader viewpoint than i did in my earlier younger life I'm going to attack Mark a little bit um, on this because what it, what we, you know, going back to Paul. As, Which as Paul? Dr. Not Paul or it, Paul, him Paul? The, the, the Paul, the, not Paul Ryder, the yeah. Paul. Yeah, the original Dr. one. Yeah. brought up. You, we, you know, we, we good Presbyterians and born people say we are saved by grace alone, correct? Mm -hmm. But in here in Mark, hey. Mark is really saying, the one who believes and is baptized will be saved. So it's an interesting, so there's things that the individual has to do where when you get to John, it's all about Jesus. Jesus will be the one. But here, I, I mean, I think there's some subtle differences here, which would be interesting. You know, I, just bringing it up. All right. You, you, I just thought, this is Trudy, that um, you talked about being baptized. So what does that mean? Does that mean sprinkling water? Does that mean immersion? Does that mean receiving the spirit into yourself? Mm. What does baptized mean? You know, uh, we don't, again, we didn't, we don't need to draw a uh, parameter around that. Uh, I mean, a circle, a, a border, a wall, whatever. It's so, not black and white, is what you're so saying. So, what would you what would you draw? What in the text would you draw a circle around? What? But uh, yeah, what? So, I mean, so, what yeah. would you draw? What would be a line you would not cross? 
as far as inside outside the circle belief accepting i i text wise no like a scripture wise so something out of the, the interpretation where you know in christ there is no male or female jew or greek uh slave or free boom that's in my circle yeah, right. I absolutely believe that to be fundamentally true. The yes. word of God. Peggy. Well, as a Christian, I would think we'd have to include and accept the, the uh, part of the be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Because in Judaism, they had baptism. But it was before Christ. So if we are any different, if our baptism is any different because of Christ, I think we have to include that statement in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. That might not, but that shouldn't mean excluding people who don't believe that way, but for us, it should be a part, I think. But, but unlike the, our Catholic friends, we as Presbyterians believe that you do not have to be baptized to be saved. I mean, that's, that's the reason why, you know, the Catholics will go and do baptism, you know, so. Start with christening. You know? I mean, which it goes back to your state, you know, so are you a follower? I mean, because I think Mark's statement's very different from John's statement. Well, Alan, you're doing a heck of a job here, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, I'm just... Well, why did Jesus... Trying to think of something... That John the Baptist <laughs> baptize him. I, I'm not saying it's not... It's one of the sacraments that we believe in, but I'm just saying... Unless you, the rest of you can, can cut me down if I'm speaking out, speaking wrong, but it's always been my understanding that we are, we are saved by the grace of, of God through Jesus Christ. Boom, period. Whether we are baptized, you know, that, that's, that's the, that's my line. That's my circle. Um, that so is the grace alone that we are saved. Now we respond to this grace. Right, that's our affirmation. That right. Okay. But you know, so what do we say to people who have kids that are stillborn, or you know, kids who haven't, or, or a person who hasn't come, hasn't, you know, uh, tragically, you have a kid that they're going home and they die, and I mean, so you get into some really interesting things if you say you have to be baptized to be saved. Well, and the flip side of that is sort of the juvenile approach where it's my get out of jail free card. I've been baptized. I know I'm going to heaven. I don't need to examine my life any farther than that. That's all I need to do. I've been told that since birth. So I've been baptized. I'm going to heaven. I go about my merry way and I don't have to have a faith that, that is part of my life or the grace that's part of my life. So they use it a little bit um, as a, a tool um, to get on with their day, I think. Yeah. I've known adults who've used that as the get out of jail card too. <laughs> <laughs> now, when I think, we're, that, I think when Libby, we're, what what Libby is saying is the um, the the fact that you've done you've gone through the steps. Uh, now you're you're okay. Um, ignores that fact of the Holy Spirit within, and so we speak about the Father, the Son, but I don't think we speak enough about the Spirit. So those who have not been baptized but have um, filled their lives with Christ-like acts and so on and so forth, they have that spirit of Christ. They might not have said, I believe in Christ, but they have the spirit of Christ. So I think it's the Trinity that we need to look at the big picture of, of the in totality, not just I believe in this or this or this. It's the totality of the spirit. However, when we receive that, the scripture goes on to tell us in many places that we need to either speak it or live it, both. But like Libby said, we need to take, uh, I feel, we need to take it out of um, a checklist 
that gets us there because in truth we are depending on God's grace. God's grace is a gift, so we have to receive it. And you can't, what they say, you can't, you don't know about the gift till you open it. So we just keep trying to delve into the deeper openings. You know, like the, the very uncomfortable story of the other Lazarus who did everything right, you know, lived the, the perfect life and then doesn't get to heaven, and but he sees the beggar next to Christ and wondering, well, why did he get there? Because you passed him every day and didn't care or, you know, help him. But somebody who thought they had the checklist and done it all, but what was it moved in the spirit the other way? That those are, I find those stories disturbing because you're like, who am I missing? What am I doing? <laughs> I, I, I suspect that many of us in this group have read Rob Bell's Love Wins mm -hmm. or were acquainted with uh, his thinking. Love Wins. And he, and, and he, he struggled, Rob Bell, in his, his book Love Wins. And he's struggling with this issue of, uh, of uh, who is in and who's out, who will be saved and who will be lost, et cetera, et cetera. And his conclusion is that 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 in the end god's love yes. and the provision god has made through the gift of jesus christ's life and death and resurrection will embrace everyone even those who have been unbaptized or who are unbaptized and even those who have never been to a church service, as we understand that, but somehow uh, have been affected by the gravity of what God has done in Jesus. And so Bell's emphasis is not so much upon the sacraments, but his emphasis is upon the gift of, uh, of God in Christ. Now that doesn't mean for him, certainly doesn't mean for me that sacraments are not important. But sacraments uh, are what my baptism, for example, which I remember in Elk River back in North Carolina, because one, because it was cold. Uh, two, because it was such a moving experience for me. But I don't think my salvation depends upon my baptism. But that baptismal experience enhanced my ability to appropriate what God has offered always in Christ to everyone. Now, others may appropriate that differently even without sacraments. And the word of God, to Bruce's point a moment ago, the word of God, to me, I always have to remember, is not Holy Scripture, but is the word of, which John, of whom John speaks when he says the word was made flesh and dwells among us. And that word some kind, sometimes in my experience comes into conflict with the written word. And when it does, I have to defer to what I perceive and what the community perceives God as Jesus the Christ saying to us is the living word. Does that make sense? Anybody? It's honorable. <laughs> well, um, are there any other profound thoughts that we have out of this passage here or things that kind of speak to us in the present situation? that we're all in, um, in, in terms of the way we're living right now or what we think is going to happen in the future. Um, how, how, how is what we're going through going to affect the community that we're part of? And, and it's, uh, it seems to me baptism is really about initiation into the community of the church. And uh, how, how are we going to be continue to be part of that community when <laughs> hopefully this will be over. <laughs> we won't have to just keep meeting like this. But I, um, Alan, for me, I, I struggle with what just the one word go. What does it mean right now when I feel like I can't go? You know, I, I, have all the world. A, I feel like I have such a helpless feeling about those people I would like to reach out or assist or be of aid to, and yet I'm in quote, a vulnerable category. So I'm staying home and staying fenced in. And it's so unlike my character to, to, so, and then I struggle with asking myself, so what's going to be the new way that we're going to go? 
Right. How's the church going to be asked in a new way to go into the future, whatever is on the other side of this pandemic? And how will we help people build their resilience on the other side of this and be a part of that? And hopefully we go knowing that God is with us and whatever happens, uh, I think there are going to be some profound changes in a lot of things. <laughs> keep hearing about you know, how, how's it going to change the ball games how's it going to change the um the way our cities are organized like they're talking about this on the radio this morning uh, people are thinking make big changes so and uh my neighbor says who isn't a church goer he says when all this is over will people will people have gotten used to doing something else on sunday morning and uh, you know are they going to go back to church he wondered I didn't have an answer for him. I guess we're we're waiting. How how is this changing us? How will we preach the gospel? In, in I think in that um, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I was just thinking about um, these times and how it's given people an opportunity to reflect. Even your neighbor to be thinking about churches oh, wow. uh, not operating or whatever. But I think at the root of this whole pandemic seems to be. Uh, a reflection on people, and and I think there's a, a real focus on love, love of, love of, um, love of life that people never experienced before or didn't have the time to experience. So they're getting to do things with their children that they never did because they were so busy working and um, creating uh, beaches out of bathrooms, and you know, just having fun and and loving life. And I think that's what God wants for all of us is to love life and love one another. You see that with the frontline workers, the love that they have. And I think I think as we come out of this, I think we're going to have a more caring and loving society. Maybe it's God's wake up call. I have no idea, but um, God is love. That's all I can say. On that positive note, <laughs> um... I think perhaps it's uh, we've had a good go at this, and uh, thank you all for your participation. Um, I'll turn it over to Bruce or Karen, maybe, to bring us to a conclusion. May I add one thing? Sure. I ask all of us to reach out to at least one person today and share something with them. Thank you. All right, so um, Paul, you're up next Tuesday, correct? I uh, want to thank Alan. Uh, we'll go fishing next Tuesday. Yeah, we go fishing uh, <laughs> next Tuesday. We get a meal as well, don't we? Right. Um, so uh, if there are any other, any additional prayer concerns for us, so we, anything we need to lift up or anything Karen needs to lift up when she prays? Uh, I would I would like to add um, my my sister's um, son-in-law's father, uh, who is in his early 60s, was, was just gone. admitted to the hospital with COVID down in um, south of Albany, Georgia, and uh, it's a touch and go situation. Yeah, there. Albany's a hotbed. Yeah. Mm. Anybody else got of anything? Yes, my daughter, Lynn. She works in a COVID virus hospital. Hi. Mm -hmm. That's correct. I want it back. Anybody have anything else? Some of you may uh, may remember Marion's, my wife's sister, Joan. She used to yeah. come down and spend time with us in Florida. Um, she's had a serious operation, is recuperating fine. But now her daughter has to go in on Monday for uh, cancer of the esophagus operation. Oh, no. So perhaps you could keep her. her name is Joanne. We're going up to help out, um, help out with, uh, with Joan because she's still recuperating and they're living in the same house. But with these conditions, you can't even go and visit people in the same house because they're very vulnerable uh, since both of them are so sick. So anyway, keep them in your prayers, please. And please con please continue to hold our cousin Jan in Sarasota up in your prayers. She's recuperating at PAMS. 
Okay. Thank and you. My, my brother-in-law and my sister, you know, they're, he's still undergoing chemo and my sister's really in a bad spot because of it. Can't, you know, he's Can't doing okay, but you know, it's just, it's with all this stuff going on she can't see her grandkids her kids mm. uh, and it she's a worry wart so she needs some uplifting also it's been a rough go for her what's her name sam uh marcia and bob <coughs> anything else All right, then please uh, join me once again. Thank you, Alan, and join me in prayer. Oh, Holy Lord, we thank you for scripture that comes to us, scripture that we just embrace and love, and scripture that we sit back and wonder, what is it that you're trying to say to us? And let us not just walk away from it, but let us live with it and allow it to talk to us in ways that open up new um, horizons and new understandings of who you are as God of love and creator of all. We lift up those that we have mentioned today that we have concerns about. We lift up um, those who have COVID and uh, especially loved ones that we know of whose faces and whose grace has been upon us. And we pray, Lord, that you will be with them and those around them and those who attend to them. And we just continue to pray that there will quickly be um, some answers into how we can control this and, and get a handle on it. But in the meantime, please may your grace and peace be with those. Um, we ask that you be with Joanne um, and Joan as they go through very trying times and Marion and Ellen as they um, just surround them with their love um, and their peace. And so many people find themselves in this situation, Lord, and um, just help us to reach out in love and grace and peace. We continue to lift up Jan and glad that she's doing better, but knows that she still needs prayers and healing. And so we keep her forefront in front of you and just thank you for all that you have given her and all that you will give her. Be with Marsha and Bob and all those who um, who worry and, and rightly so, who are concerned about their health and the health of others and just the isolation and in the um in the missing of the touch and the seeing and the joy and the laughter um, and the kisses and we just pray that that your your grace of peace and patience and love will be with all those today um may we find your goodness all around us um may we share that goodness and may we figure out ways that we the church can um spread the good news to all people when we are told to go and we cannot go um, I'm sure, oh Lord, if we um, focus on you, you will enlighten us. So as we go this day, we give thanks and peace and grace for all, all that you have given us. In the name of your son, Jesus the Christ, our Lord and Savior, we do pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Amen.